Here is a contribution by our friend Ken Haas Christian. Haas has since passed away but his memory lives on in his research of the hairy guy. In mid-October 1996, I made a hunting trip for mule deer bucks into the Passaten Valley. The Passaten River Valley is located west of the town of Princeton off of the Hope Princeton Highway just east of the border of Manning Park, then some 10 to 12 miles in the bush very close to the border of the state of Washington. I towed a 16-foot trailer into the area with my truck and decided to make camp at a favorite spot of mine in a clearing along Peave Creek. Being truly tired from both the three-hour drive from home and the stress from a week's work, I made a quick dinner, washed it down with some cool mountain water from the creek, and then hit the sack early for some much-needed rest. About midnight I awoke, got out of bed, and then quickly stepped outside into the cold to answer the call of nature. Upon opening the trailer door, I was surprised to see snow quietly falling with a light skiff already accumulated on the ground. After attending to the business at hand, I quickly climbed back into my warm bed with high hopes that the snow outside would be around to offer decent tracking conditions come morning. A crisp, clear dawn found me slowly hiking in towards Trapper Lake, high in the hills above and east of Peavy Creek. I hadn't gone too far when suddenly I cut across a fresh trail of huge, five-toed, barefoot, man-like tracks made in the inch or so of freshly fallen snow. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and upon careful examination these man-like tracks did not appear to have any type of claw or nail marks ahead of the toes like that of a grizzly or black bear would. These man-like tracks were an estimated 16 to 17 inches long by 7 to 8 inches wide with a stride of about 4 to 5 feet, much further than I could possibly step even stretching my legs out. I followed this reasonably straight line of giant man-like tracks for several hundred yards until they entered a thicket of young evergreens and blowdowns. These barefoot tracks seemed strange in that they did not wander about like the tracks of most wild animals would and showed little or no straddle from an imaginary line through their center. Thinking back, it almost seemed like the maker of those tracks was heading for a place with a purpose in mind. After looking into the thicket and envisioning all sorts of strange scenarios, I decided I didn't want to meet the maker of those tracks and rapidly hightailed it out of that country for the season. I did, however, return to the same area the following September with a friend and we managed to harvest two beautiful mule deer bucks. Although I looked hard, I found no further tracks or possible Sasquatch sign. Over my last 40 or so years of hunting big game in the wilds of British Columbia, I have, at times, been far too close to big bears. I have smelled, seen and tracked both grizzly and black bears. The tracks I found in the Passaten River Valley during October of 1996 were not the tracks of a bear or any other animal that I am familiar with. During the fall of 1998 I knew a party hunting the Jedney area off the Alaska Highway that had a half a moose ripped down off a meat rack that was a measured 14 feet from the ground. Upon a very close check, these experienced hunters didn't see any grizzly or black bear sign around the area. Nor could they find anything else to indicate they knew who or what stole their moose. I checked out the meat rack myself, I was camped only about half mile away and our lower hanging moose meat wasn't touched, and came to the conclusion that unless someone came 40 miles into the bush equipped with a big ladder, there was no way in hell they could have got the moose down, besides, the rope that held the meat up was snapped and not cut. The summer of 1998 found a group of teenage boys preparing to have a camp out on the rear of a private 18-acre piece of property located outside of Derrick, BC. The boys had set up their tents in a glade, roughly 200 to 300 feet away from the family home, inside the edge of the forest, which still remains quite wild and rugged, at the base of the Coast Range Mountains. It was just shortly before dark, and all the boys were gathered around a small central campfire when something screamed at them with a huge volume from inside the edge of the forest. Whatever screamed at them could also be clearly heard pacing back and forth and breaking heavy branches inside the tree line. In a follow-up conversation at my home, one of the boys described the warning type scream as monkey-like with a volume that would be impossible for any human voice to duplicate without the assistance of an amplifier. On June 30, 2003 we had another report of a possible Sasquatch encounter from the same above-mentioned property outside of Derrick, B.C. According to the three scared witnesses who had wandered into a swampy and remote area of the property hardly ever visited by the residents, threatening high-pitched screams, the snapping sounds of heavy branches and strange, non-human mumbling or murmuring voices and other unintelligible sounds were heard after they stumbled upon a crudely built bed made out of old cedar boughs. The witnesses also claimed to have smelled a very strong odor described as being a mixture of sulfur, rotten meat or eggs and human excrement. On Tuesday, July 29th we had another report of possible ongoing Sasquatch activity from the above-mentioned property owners outside Derrick, B.C. Shortly before dark the residents reported hearing extremely heavy footfalls outside that shook the entire house, scaring the females at home at the time quite badly. Shortly after this happened, 
Two very loud high-pitched screams were heard coming from just inside the edge of the bush on their property. The sounds of the scream reportedly set off howling from some of the dogs on farms in the area. Shortly after dark the residents were driving towards town on a road in front of their property when a very large rock suddenly flew from heavy bush at the roadside and narrowly Here, I will recount a report from just outside Dirouche, BC, here is her statement. Hi my name is Christina and I live in Dirouche. The scream report that is on your website, was it heard around 2 a.m.? I will tell you why I ask. I was sleeping in a tent on my deck with my dog because it was so hot in the house when at around 2 a.m. a weird very loud scream woke us both up and made us jump out of our skins. All the dogs as far off as I could hear were all barking for a while. Also I heard the same thing about a year ago while sitting in my computer room that faces the north. It too was around 2 a.m. in the morning. Another report which came to me from that area is as follows. We had a chance to investigate a sighting report outside of Dirouche and we were lucky enough to find one possible Sasquatch track measuring 16 inches in length by 6 inches in width. Due to the prolonged hot and dry spell of weather we have been having in the Fraser Valley, the ground in the area was hard and dry and did not lend well to making tracks, or tracking any animal at all. The single possible track we did find appeared to be leading away from what looked to be a crudely built nest or bedding area consisting of scattered cedar boughs, and was situated on the crest of a small knob of soft dirt. Most of the weight appeared to be placed on the toe area of the track as the foot pivoted and curled in a natural stepping motion over the top of the small mound of dirt. The big toe measured 3 inches in length and was impressed into the soil about 1 and 1 half inches deep. As this track was not flat and was in a rough area off the main trail, it did not appear to be faked. We were very impressed with the age and size of the trees in the old growth forest, mixed red cedar, Douglas fir, hemlock and various hardwoods, with some trees over 8 feet across where the ongoing Sasquatch activity is taking place. If a Sasquatch wanted to hide in this old growth forest I firmly believe it would be next to impossible to see it, one step behind any one of a thousand of the huge trees would be all it would take for any intelligent animal to stay very well concealed. It was starting to get dark so we decided to make camp for the night, just as we were both starting to fall asleep we heard the most blood-curdling scream than a bunch of low garbled noises, we turned on every light we had with us and scoured the bush around us, we could smell this very rotten odor, rotten eggs and SHT? Anyways we never went back to sleep that night, and at daybreak we proceeded to hike further up into the canyon. We couldn't believe our eyes, there it was crouched over a pond in the creek catching minnows. It never saw us. Suddenly it turned around and looked at us, stood up and bolted into the bush. I must say we went back down the way we came up, I'll never go back into that area again. This is a true story and if you wish you can contact me by cell phone at 34x. B. Hey. Note. In a follow-up phone conversation Behay went on to explain that he has been into this area in the past searching for gold and has found 16 to 17 inch Sasquatch tracks himself, and on one other occasion had reports from a friend that had been in the same area prospecting and had seen large barefoot man-like tracks in the snow leading away from the fairly recent wreckage of a helicopter high in Spindle Canyon. Behay estimated the height of the Sasquatch he encountered at somewhere between 7 and 8 feet tall. Barry's dad Vince Sr. had arranged a boat ride into an isolated beach at the mouth of Debeck Creek with his brother Joe who at the time owned and operated several big logging operations in the Pit Lake region. Note, at the time Barry and I would have been 8 or 9 years old, Barry's younger brother Terry, who also tagged along, would have been about 5 or 6, and Vince Sr. would have probably been in his late 30s. Joe picked us up at Pit Lake boat launch after dropping his logging crew off at camp one early morning, and we traveled by speed boat north up Pit Lake about 15 kilometers. Joe dropped us and our gear off on the beach at the mouth of Debeck Creek with a promise to keep an eye out for us when he passed by each morning. Since the weather was warm and clear, it was decided no tent was required, probably because Barry and I insisted to his dad that we camp in the wilds just like our heroes Davy Crockett and Daniel Boone, and we would sleep in our bags and blankets under the stars. Vince Sr. and young Terry picked a beautiful flat spot on the pea gravel beach right near the mouth of Debeck Creek to camp. Barry and I decided we wanted to camp like the Indians and mountain men did and found a spot about 80 feet away to lay our sleeping bags. We tucked in a hole right in under a 10-foot high root ball that was still attached to giant red cedar log. The hole inside the cedar trees' root system looked more like a little cave just big enough for us to crawl in. We did the usual stuff that kids and dads do while camping. Roasted wieners, went swimming in the lake, sat around and cooked over the campfire, went on short hikes up the creek to try fishing, and generally had a bunch of fun. We did, however, do one thing that was a little different that may have played a part in what happened. While back at our hideout Barry and I had a long wolf howling contest on our first night there, until his dad told us to shut up and go to sleep. Although I can't for the life of me remember the sound that woke Barry and I up from a deep sleep under our log, I do recall that it was just beginning to break day. 
I also remember that we both jumped up out of our sleeping bags and headed for his dad at a real quick pace. Once Barry and I got over to where his dad was sitting with his .303 British Army rifle clutched in his hands, we could plainly see he was rattled, shaking like a leaf, and as white as a ghost. Even though we were kids we both knew by looking at his dad's reaction and facial expressions that something was seriously wrong. Thinking back, when you see real fear in a grown person, it's little things like this that you can never forget. I remember that Barry and I were scared stiff after seeing his dad, but we did ask him what was wrong. He replied to us that he kept his loaded rifle aimed at a big black bear walking continuously on its hind legs that had been sniffing, pawing and circling around and around the log that Barry and I were sleeping under. Now even at this young age Barry and I were not stupid city slickers. We both came from hunting families and knew that bears don't remain on their hind legs while walking. I clearly remember that we gave each other a look and knew that his dad's story was pure bullshit, excuse my language. In any case, I also remember that as soon as we finished gulping down our breakfast the first thing that Barry and I did was casually wander back over to our log hideout to search the ground for tracks. I do remember finding some big tracks but all they really were was holes in the pea gravel where something had gone around the big root ball in circles. It might be of interest to note that in 2003 I was contacted by a Brad Hay from Abbotsford, BC, who reported seeing a Sasquatch not more than one mile from where we camped at the mouth of Debec Creek. Also, John Green's report, page 19 Encounters with Bigfoot, of the two prospectors that encountered an estimated 12 to 15 foot Sasquatch that left 22 to 24 inch tracks was no more than 5 miles from this location. John Green also received a report from two men who in 1933 witnessed a Sasquatch eating berries about 3 miles from Debec Creek. I also watched a private 1967 video of a prospector slash trapper named Warren Scott who lived in a huge treehouse. Scott had built his house 20 feet from ground level, because of deep snow in the winter, some 5,000 feet up on top of a mountain located at the northerly end of Pitt Lake. Scott showed his sketches of Sasquatch on camera and made a comment about a Sasquatch migration route that has stuck with me for all these years. Believe it or not, my lifelong friend Dan Garrick, and three witnesses, who owns the Upper Pitt River Lodge, http colon slash slash www.pittriverlodge.com, once found fresh 17-inch Sasquatch tracks in a particular valley, and made the exact same comment as Scott to me about a Sasquatch migration route over 30 years later. Garrick told me this after spending many hours flying all over this country in Jet Ranger helicopters and noting that there is only one open valley between Pitt, Stave and Harrison Lakes that does not end in sheer cliffs. If I was ever going to get serious about finding Sasquatch, and had the time and means to do it, I wholeheartedly believe the place to do it would be up in the Boise Valley country northwest of the head of Pitt Lake. However, I would never consider going into the Boise Valley alone. Why? My own experiences and the following information, and good advice, from page 22 of John Green's book Encounters with Bigfoot. The mountain country around the head of Pitt Lake is extremely rugged and quite a few people have gone in there and never come out. It is supposed to hold a lost gold load of fabulous wealth, which is why some of the people have gone there, but whether or not the story of the gold is true the story of the missing people certainly is. I have noted the gradual increase in the total, note, the number missing people is now 22, during my years in the newspaper business. The terrain itself provides plenty of reasons why lone venturers might never be seen again, but there are persistent traditions that the Sasquatch have something to do with it. Although John Green did not mention it, or didn't know it at the time of his report, the two prospectors that encountered an estimated 12 to 15 foot Sasquatch that left 22 to 24 inch tracks, were in the Boise Valley. The Boise has never been logged and has giant cedar and fir trees over 1,000 years old. It is also the only valley at about the 4,000 foot level northwest of Pitt Lake that contains small lakes. How do I know this stuff? When I had my guiding and wilderness adventure company going I was deeply involved, and have the newspaper articles, maps and videos to prove it, in getting the Boise Valley set aside as part of a park in the Pinecone slash Burke Wilderness area. I was also the only person that supplied water and land transportation into the Boise Valley and Upper Pitt River Valley. Okay, dear listener, that about wraps it up for now. My name is Jerry Matthews. You can reach me at yellowcoyote at talus.net. Thank you for your interest, and until the next time, keep searching. <laughs>